Wow. Toda. Toda Rabba, Rabbi Wilds, for your beautiful, touching words about your mother, and for the exaggerated words about, about me. Thank you for exaggerating. It's like the Mashiach came to Manhattan. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, but um, really, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank the Wilds family, uh, the uh, uh, lawyer Michael Wilds, and uh, he, he's the reason I'm here in the States. It's because of him and his, uh, help, and his helpful way. He helped us arrange this this shlichut. We're here for a year. Me, my husband Yedidya, and our five kids. We live this year here, North Woodmere, five towns. And uh, I work uh, a lot for the Mizrahi movement, World Mizrahi movement, also for YU Stern College. And um, basically, I thought tonight. Now, after hearing your beautiful words, I think it even matches. I mean, what I prepared is really, I would, I think, uh, really describes uh, uh, your mother. Um, I prepared like um, really. Sh something, presentation that will work in, in a minute, and uh, something that, in, in order to share like my, my life journey. Um, I grew up in the city of Herzliya, it's in the center of Israel, uh, near Tel Aviv, and at the age of six, and I guess uh, you know that at the age of six you already help like your self-esteem, how you see yourself in the society, so when I look back, I think I saw myself as a loser, completely, a failure. Okay, all right, what is it? I was wondering, yeah, when it comes to technical things, I'm a also a failure. Oh, okay. <laughs> much better. <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, maybe maybe it explains what happened, what just happened here. Everything people else, like did was so successful, and everything I tried to, to do, make at the end of the day, ended up like really like like um, like a mess. All the kids had these cool hobbies, you know, in the afternoon they were like dancing, <laughs> learning how to play the guitar, the flute, the piano painting, drawing, sports, all kinds of activities. I was awful. Everything I tried, like, came out. And um, even today, you see the mic. If I had to change a light bulb, it's impossible. If I had to park in reverse, sorry. <laughs> Driving forward, by the way, not something, I, not something to write home about. So everything I tried, and I was already six, and you feel quite dead. And then something changed at the age of, um, at the age of six, yeah, six, uh, around seven. Something changed. It was uh, during like elementary school, Bet Sefer Yisodi, Kita Aleph, first grade in, in Israel, Bet Sefer Lepto, a school in Herzliya. Teacher Riki, she was the Mora, the teacher, she taught us how to read and how to write alphabet, you know. And for me, it wasn't just, just a technical thing you learn at school. She was like giving me a gift and a skill. Something was revealed, you know, within me. And it was for the first time, I felt I'm better than others. Now it's a huge you know, you feel so good about yourself when, for the first time, you're not chasing them, you know, trying to, no, no, you're the best. They ask you to write something, to help them with, you know, reading, writing became my, you know, my thing. So, the question is, what do you do? I see it today as a, as a mother, it's really hard. When a kid comes back, usually, I mean, if he comes back with, let's say, like a 50, okay? They are very bad, bad grade, right? Here, of course, you never got a 50, but my kids and I came back home a lot of times with a, a beautiful 50, Chavishim. <laughs> so, what do you do? Uh, usually when you see such a grade, you say, okay, that's an emergency. Here's an alarm. That's urgent, right? I have to take care of it. The kid is, you know. So I bring a tutor, you know, private teacher. Someone sits with him. I sit with him. We work hard in order to improve, you know. And then at the end of the day, let's say he, it's okay, he gets like a 60, 70, oh, Baruch Hashem, he passed, Baruch Hashem, he's average. Okay, good, let's continue. Now let's say a kid comes back home with a mea. How is your Hebrew? We will throw away Hebrew. Mea, what's that? 100, of course. Perfect 100. So then what do you do? That's not urgent. No alarm, nothing is an emergency. Oh, great, great way to go, 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 go. When we lived in Yerushalayim, that's where we live. So when a kid came back home with a man, I said, oh, that's good, take your bicycle, go to Gan you know where Gan Saker is? The big gardens in the, the entrance to Shalai. Uh, buy yourself some ice cream, that's what I, you know, as a prize, that's beautiful. Call it about man, good for you, Ishaq Kwa. Today, when they come back home with a man, in, in, in the States, I don't, kids are less independent. I mean, in Shalai, they were everywhere. You know, the Ravka, the prepaid card, like everything, the train, the buses, everything, central station. Here, the maximum, the best thing I can say is, oh, you got a man, let's, uh, let's 
Order something on Amazon Prime. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's invent, okay? Things are different here. So basically, but I will never tell him, oh, you got a man. Wow, we must work harder, because you got a man. You must work, let's bring, no, no, no. It's okay, it's the maximum. I realized when I was seven, when I was seven, that what you learn at school is just the minimum. It's not the maximum. You should improve, you should develop, you should reach new, you know, reach, think of new ways to, to use this new skill. And that's what I did. I mean, I treated the notebooks and the books as, okay, that's the obvious thing. Now let's see what else can I do with this new skill. So I started writing to a kid's magazine, and it was published back then during the 90s in Israel. I wrote a poem. That was the beginning of my journalism career. It was called, in Hebrew, Shira Agvania, which means the, good, the tomato song, Shira Agvania. And that was the beginning of my career. Four lines, short song, four lines in Hebrew. It's about how I, I, don't know, I hate to eat, to eat the tomato and my mommy forces me to eat the tomato or something. Four lines. At the end of the day, it was published. It was printed two weeks later and I became a celebrity and I came to school. All the kids were like, wow. I mean, they read it and they were passing it around and the teachers read it. It was like, wow. So I tried again and again. I wrote uh, the onion song, the mushroom song, <laughs> the carrot song. I tried, I tried for a year. But I was at the age of seven or eight, second grade. I realized poetry wasn't the right path. Let's try something new. Let's try to use this new skill in, in, a, in a better way. Working? Let's see. This? Yeah. Okay. How did you become a journalist? That's the question we're answering now, okay? If you, had, uh, if you didn't have a clue. So, um, imagine a very, very boring shiur. The teacher is talking about something. The class is like trying, well, trying to follow. I was sitting next to a, a girl. She was a friend of mine. Uh, uh, her name was Karen. And I sent her a note. Now, I had no idea what, what, what was I doing, okay? But these are really important moments in my life. I sent her a note. I wrote that, Karen, is it true you adopted a dog? Because I heard a rumor they adopted their new dog. She wrote one word back, Ken, which means yes. Okay, so we have the potential here to, to ask another question. What's the name of the dog? She writes back, Rexy. What's the color? Brown. What's the type? Etc. Etc. Um, I had a mountain of notes, okay, at the end of this, this I had a mountain of notes in, on, on my desk, and I was just asking her, like, I think 30 or 40 different questions, like, um, how did your parents agree? She said, oh, uh, me and my brother, we promised them we'll take him out for a walk every morning. So I wrote, wow, we do wake up every morning. She's like, no, after two days we retired, we, we got tired, mommy's taking him out every day. Anyway, this whole interview. Once again, I was having my first interview without even knowing what is an interview. I was like eight. I took the notes back home. I was rewriting everything, editing, you know, reorganizing all the materials, and I sent it to this magazine, okay? Two weeks later, imagine, a huge headline, two pages, and a huge headline, Karen and the dog. Everything you want to know about Rexy by Sivan Raham, seven years old from Herzliya. Boom. The next day, I walk into the class. A lot of enthusiasm. Karen comes in. A lot of enthusiasm. There was one person there who showed less enthusiasm. That was the teacher, obviously. She, uh, she took Karen away. She changed the seats, you know, the uh, places where you sit in class. She switched everything. So she took Karen away. She brought another girl that was now sitting next to me. Her name was Sheer. Now, use your imagination, okay? Two weeks later, huge headline, two pages. Sheer's napkin collection. <laughs> what can I do? That's the hobby I found. She was collecting naps napkins and etc. etc. It became a format. We used to say that every time the teacher would switch the seats in our class, she basically edited the next edition of that magazine. Every kid, every kid that came and sat next to me became an item. 35 kids, 35 interviews. Okay, finished. The whole class was interviewed. Oh, Hashem. Was it a unique class? Was it a rare class? I don't think so. It was an average normal class in the city of Herzliya during the 90s in Israel. But the truth is, I think every person is unique. Everyone was created in a divine, special way. I was completely secular. I'll tell you in a few minutes how secular I was. But I think the first time I felt 
something spiritual, something divine. The first time maybe I felt Hashem was back then when I was looking at every child, thinking, okay, what's special about her? What's unique about him? And I started realizing we all have a story, and there is no copy paste when it comes to souls, to human beings. Okay, we're all all very special, one of a kind masterpiece. And then, okay, I finished. It, as I said, I interviewed the whole class. What now? So we had all the grades, all the teachers, the principal, the nurse, the secretary of the school, the cleaner of the school. At the end of the day, the okay, I interviewed the whole school. Now what? I was invited then for the first time to the Israeli TV. I was nine or ten, and they invited me as a young girl to interview old people. It became like a format. I asked like serious questions, but I'm all, all, uh, um, I'm just nine. But uh, I interviewed like famous uh, politicians and all kinds of like figures, singers, celebrities, and it became like a gimmick. They, they liked it. I want to show you just one example, an example from these days. That, that picture was taken during the 90s. Uh, this is Itzhak Rabin, our former Prime Minister of Blessed Memory. And that's me, sitting next to him. It was a prime time show on Channel 2. It was called the Dan Shilon Show, if we have any Israelis here. And I was interviewing Rabin for like two or three hours. We edited later, but we were sitting there for two or three hours. And uh, basically, that's just one example. During that month, I remember I interviewed Itzhak Rabin of Blessed Memory. A week later, Shimon Perez, the foreign minister of blessed memory, and a week later, the Power Rangers, they came to Israel. <laughs> yeah. Exclusive interview. I met them at the Ben Gurion airport when they landed. I think I should also add of blessed memory because I think they're all, what's going on with the Power Rangers? Does anyone have any idea? I'm not following it. Yeah? Someone, I don't know. I'm not following. Anyway, so that was my, 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 my childhood. I want to tell you it became a hobby, but the truth is school became the hobby and that became the main thing I did. I was there every day interviewing people on like radio, TV, magazines, newspapers, I was all over. And um, so you could learn a lot from this story. You could look at it as a positive story of a girl, you know, describing the gifts Hashem gave her and trying, working hard in order to, you know, use them and instead of being like the class loser, trying to create new ways of, you know, feeling better about yourself, both Hashem. And I do think we can learn a lot uh, from that. But that story is not so positive when we look at four uh, factors. And I think that's one of Israel's problems up until today. If you follow, if you know what's going on in Israel, um, I think I wasn't invited just because I was talented, both Hashem. I think I was invited because of these four factors that really influenced the fact I was there. And I was there, I was taking someone else like seat when I was sitting there. Um, so I meet people, I'm, I'm 38. Uh, when I meet people like approximately my age, they tell me, we watch you every day. We came back uh, home from school, like, and we were watching you on TV. You were there every day, but we weren't there, never. And these kids are, I would say, we have so many streams. Our beautiful Israeli society is so diverse. And the fact I was invited every day was basically sad because of these four factors. I'll, I'll, I'll mention, I was secular, completely, very, very secular. I am Chiloni. I was Smolani. You know what Smolani is? We look at the political spectrum. In Israel, it's, we don't have two parties. We have many, too many parties. But uh, um, I was in the left uh, side of the political spectrum. I really supported Rabin, Oslo agreements, maybe even lefter than Rabin. I was really in the left. So Chiloni, Smolani, Ashkenazi. Okay, that I can't change. My parents are, my ancestors are, are from Russia. So, Chiloni, Smolani, Ashkenazi, and from Herzliya. I lived in Herzliya, and this picture was taken in Herzliya studios, Ulpanei Herzliya, the largest, the best, the biggest in, in Israel. So, I was walking uh, two blocks from my house, okay, I, I just walked there. Nobody had to even, like, order something, not, not, nothing. So, basically, I think while I was sitting there, no Ethiopian kid was sitting there. No kid who just came from Russia or from the States. No kid who is the T or Haredi, you know, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, Masorti, conservative, traditional. No kid from the periphery, the South, Kirat the, 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 the North, Kirat the South, Sderot, Eilat. No kid from a kibbutz or from a settlement. No kid who is Mizrahi, you know, not Ashkenazi. No one who is even Arabi. There are uh, Israeli Arab kids in Israel, not Palestinians, Israeli Arabs. 
No one was there, just me representing the Israeli kid. No, I wasn't the average Israeli kid. And I think our challenge today, you know, the Israeli media, we still face a lot of challenges. That's one of them. To make every child feel at home and every adult. He's represented, he's part of this beautiful structure of, of, of our society. So today, when I look back, what I try to do today in the Israeli media is change this equation. There's no right way to be the good Israeli. There's so many good Israelis out there, and we, the media, we should make them feel much better. That's maybe the story about journalism. Okay, so we understand. I could continue forever working as a, an Israeli journalist, uh, but now let's move forward and talk a little bit about Judaism. Okay, what happened? Uh, what happened? Or many people come to me and say, okay, what happened? <laughs> what's, what's the problem? And I will elaborate like a little bit. I think, um, I said earlier, I think I never had such a place like the M uh, uh, MG, I mean never, uh, uh, a place that invites people to, uh, to, to feel, to touch, to taste, uh, to learn more about their ident identity. Until the age of 15, I never met a religious Jew. It sounds crazy, crazy, because it's the state of Israel. Never met someone who is the T. When, when I say the T, I mean Shomer uh, Shabbat, okay? I don't care you have all your definitions here to the right, to the left, Hasidic, Yeshivish, modern, I don't care, all this, we have it in Israel too. I, when I say the T, now we have all these Chardal, lights, eh, this kind of Shas, Breslev, Chabad, I know, I know, Baruch Hashem. We have a lot of strict, you know, strict streams and definitions. Okay. At the end of the day, I never met someone who is Shomer Kashrut. Never met someone who is Shomer Shabbat, who keeps Shabbat, who observes nothing. It's impossible, okay? It, it could happen in Israel. It's, it's really sad. Today, I think, where I live today, five towns, it's really impossible. You can't live in five towns without meeting someone who's Dati until the age of 15. Sorry, can't be. But unfortunately, in Herzliya, it was possible. So what happened? What happened is, I met three girls. And that's maybe one other message I want to convey. I think we have no idea how important we are, how influential we, we, we can be. I met three girls, where they were my age. I was 15, they were 15. They were average the T girls, Neakiva girls, from the city of Beersheva in the south. I met them and immediately, of course, I interview, interviewed them. That's why I knew, you know, but that's what I did, everyone I met. So I told them, I must interview you. They said, why? I told them, what do you mean? Three religious girls were found in the state of Israel. That's like a scoop. That's an item. I never thought you guys exist. What do you want? Okay. They said, okay, why don't you interview us? No problem. At the end of the conversation, they said, please, don't publish the interview. Please. I told them, why? And they said, it's going to be a fadiha. You know what fadiha is? How is your slang in Hebrew? Okay. It's, it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. You, you're, you're, you're really, your questions are silly. Your questions are clueless. You, you're really asking, don't publish the interview. We are really... Okay, tell them, okay, so what do you suggest? And they said, boy the Shabbat. Come for Shabbat, see what Shabbat is all about. As an investigative journalist, I had a mission, I came. I took the bus to work from Herzliya to Beersheva. I came there. Everything I saw became holy in my eyes. Everything I saw was a holy custom. So, first thing I learned is to be nervous 15 minutes before Shabbat. It's a holy custom. Everything I saw, the people were like shouting, suddenly, suddenly, it starts 15 minutes before Shabbat starts, it starts. People are screaming, shouting, what did you do? Hard water, the, the towel, the, the, the oven, the dishes, the, 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 the. but again. I was like, okay. The first time I came, Shabbat started, I think it was like 4.30. They invited me a few months later. Shabbat started at 7.30. Once again, the whole thing. I was like, okay, something is wrong. I mean, there's something here. Maybe, I said to myself, maybe it's like a secret. They only tell them, you know, the last minute, they tell them when Shabbat starts. And then they have to get ready. It's like a reality show. You have this race. You tell them that they start. I like, okay, maybe that's the explanation. Then I thought, you know what? In Alaska, Shabbat starts at midnight. Maybe there, you know, they shouted, oh, it's 11.45, you didn't do anything all day. I don't know. Anyway, I want to tell you something. I still keep this costume every Shabbat. I do it as a holy tradition. I still do it. The first thing I learned, I still do it. But then I learned more serious things. We were lighting candles. 
and we had a beautiful Kabbalah Shabbat. We were singing the Chavadi, and we were eating beautiful meals, delicious meals. We were sitting together, understanding. At the first, I, I, I remember the first time I was nervous. I mean, what's going on? I mean, okay, they're eating, and what? Like, and now what? Let's eat and, and move forward. I mean, we have so many movies, cinemas, clubs. Let's do something. There are things on TV. I don't know. You are the event. Nothing waits out there. Everything is in here. Okay. You eat and you experience. It was the longest meal I ever had. I was like, what's going on? What's wrong with these people? Don't you have, don't you have something to do? Stop. That's what we're doing. You are part of the event. Nobody out there. It's not external. It's inter what's happening here? That's the event. Okay. The, uh, I remember we walked to Shul on Shabbat morning, and I was reading that for the first time. I heard the parasha. I had no idea we had this palace called Parashat Shavua. The weekly portion we read, I learned it there. And we had to the Shlishi and Abdallah. Everything was beautiful. Everything was nice. But I'll tell you something. These things did not make me, didn't, uh, you know, I didn't change. I didn't become, like, become Shomer Shabbat. What really changed me, and that will maybe be, uh, I'll summarize by, with, with this story, and then maybe we'll open it up to like Q, Q and A, if you have questions, answers, and whatever, comments. But I, what, what changed me, and I think this story is extremely relevant today, to the nowadays Jews. What changed me was, I think, the mechanism of Shabbat. It was the seventh time I was there. And once again, I was an investigative journalist. I was asking myself, what creates this special atmosphere? I liked the atmosphere. I mean, I saw things there that were pretty cool, and I said to myself, one day when I'll get married, Bezrat Hashem, I'll take it, I'll adopt these things, and I'll take it into my house. You know, the Kiddush, I like the atmosphere, but I had no idea, how do you create such a nice atmosphere? And the answer is not so nice. The answer is very serious. The answer is sometimes very technical, very ta practical, very tachlis. I collected these strange stories. First story, I remember, we were sitting there, the little sister, she was three, she was playing on the carpet with this microphone, electronical device with sounds, I don't know, games, I don't know, it was something. So she was playing with, with it, and her brother, she, he was eight, he walked there and said, Oi, what do you do? It's a sin. So his mother told him, oh, Danny, come down. She's just three. You are eight. You are a big boy. For you, it's an avera. I'm like, okay, this family needs some help. Okay? <laughs> she's three, it's an avera. He's eight, she's not. He's not. She, it's not an avera. He's eight, it's an avera. And the mother explains what's going on here. It's just a microphone. So the girl, she was three, she took it, and she put it on the Shabbat, Shabbat table, in the middle of the meal. So the father starts, like, he comes there, I had no idea what is Mukze, but she knew how to touch it, what you do it. He was like dancing, I don't know. <laughs> putting it there, putting a towel on it. I mean, why did you just turn it off? Like, what's going on here? Is there a doctor in this neighborhood? I mean, really, this family is quite weird. And I was collecting all these stories, you know, asking them, what do you do? Why? Why is it important? Why is it important? I remember one of my friends, as I said, we were 15. She said, um, one day she said to her mother, Mommy, can I eat the cheesecake? And I was thinking, it's kosher, it's your kitchen, why can't you eat the cheesecake? Now, look at her mother's response. Okay? She was asking, Mommy, can I eat the cheesecake? Her mother was, started counting. <laughs> and then the girl goes, no, no, Mommy, we benched at 2. We finished eating the meat at 1.30. Oh, new calculation. <laughs> I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. What's the problem? Maybe they're counting calories. It's a new diet. <laughs> What's wrong? And then I asked again, what's the problem with you guys? What's so important? Why do you care? Two hours, three hours, who cares? Who cares? I remember two brothers were talking about a sale in the mall, in Be'er Sheva Mall. There was a huge sale on not Black Friday, but a Be'er Sheva sale on Matzai Shabbat. So when they said, okay, we need two jeans, two t-shirts for 30 shekels, with three and sneakers for 60 shekels, and we'll take the number six bus. They were planning everything. The father walks in and says, shh, Shabbat. I'm like, okay, they're just talking about it. They're not buying anything, maybe you don't see, but maybe there was a, an Alexa there who, who listening and ordering things. I don't know, nobody's listening. They're just discussing, you know, imagining. I don't know. Once again, you're not allowed to talk on these things on Shabbat, and you don't touch certain things, and you don't eat certain things. What's going on here? At the end of the day, I realized these people weren't crazy. They were committed. 
They weren't insane. They were devoted. And I became more committed because of these people. What I saw there impressed me. And I wanted to, wanted to be a part of this commitment because I realized it's not just the atmosphere. That's just the superficial, the, you know, the layer you see. When you dig into, you, when you want to understand really what Shabbat is all about, it's much more, I would say, serious. And I saw, okay, I saw this beautiful picture. And the Israeli artist, Dir Menusi, who also became Shomer Shabbat, created this, I think, beautiful, beautiful explanation of what Shabbat is all about. What's written here, you see? What's the word? Yeah, the can, right? But the can is created out of? Lo, 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 lo. Many, many, many small law. How many law do we have here? Don't count, I'll tell you. 39. Why 39, of course? Lamed tet melachot. Sorry, lamed tes melachos. How do you say that? Sorry about that. Yeah, lamed tes melachos. Don't tell them in Israel that's how I speak. Lamed tet melachot. So we take the lamed tet melachot, the 39 things we're not supposed to do on Shabbat, the basic principles of Shabbat, and we, it, it, sometimes you can spend your whole life stuck between these law, 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 everything is so frustrating. And I can't eat this, I can't touch this, I can't do this, and then I can drive, I can text. But at the end of the day, from a bird's eye, eye view, when you zoom out, you see it creates a huge can, a meaningful sweet can. And I think that's what Jude, Shabbat is all about, but also what Judaism is all about. Because we need these fences, firm boundaries, we need these laws to create a can. And that made me, Baruch Hashem Shomer and Shabbat, at the age of 19, I first had a big event, first like challenge, a big event with colleagues from the media on Friday night. I told them for the first time I can't come. They said, you're so primitive, you're narrow-minded, you're so uh, like nudnik, nebech, you know, satmer, satmer, just, just satmer, don't drive on Shabbat. You are more liberal, it's satmer, I like, can't come. Okay, I told them, I'm sorry, I can't come. The next day they called me and said, we found another stupid, narrow-minded guy just like you among our colleagues, and he is also, he can't come. So we will postpone the event. It's gonna take place on, it's gonna happen Saturday night, Mosei Shabbat. I told him, okay, I'll come. At the entrance, one of the organizers, they were standing there, accepting all the guests. Oh, here's the primitive Satmer, how are you? Stand here. I want you to meet the other nudnik. Because of you two, we had to change everything. Change, stand here, I'll call him, okay? His name is Yedidya Meir. Oh. He walks there, oh. comes back with this guy, that's my husband, Baruch oh. Hashem. <laughs> Hollywood, that's Hollywood in Israel. That's how I met my husband, Shabbat was the matchmaker. And I really saw how Shabbat brings more bracha into your life. So uh, how many weddings did you say? There are 323. I think maybe Shabbat, what you do here with Shabbat can make this number even even bigger. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, it's not, I don't tell you keep Shabbat and immediately you'll find your shidduch, okay? But uh, it might help, it might help, it might uh, bring more bracha into your life.